The Trollenberg Terror is a British 1950s sci-fi movie about mountain climbers who mysteriously disappear after encountering a radioactive cloud. The original Trollenberg Terror was a TV miniseries, and it was then remade into this movie. The movie version was written by Jimmy Sangster, who is best known for writing a lot of the more popular Hammer horror movies. When you asked me to watch this, I thought it was going to be a movie that was overlooked for being really well written or really well done, kind of a gem that people just didn't know too much about. But within the first 30 seconds, it was very clear what kind of movie this was going to be. With the two guys on the mountain and they have a climber with them who's higher and he runs into something and falls and it turns out his head has been ripped off and the budget is extremely low. Those two guys, you can see the one bumping into the rock behind him and it's all spongy. I did think this was... Kind of like you described, a movie that gets overlooked that I think is more deserving of a better name in history. I wouldn't say it's one of the best 50 sci-fi movies, but I did think it was particularly well-made and well-written and had a lot better ideas than a lot of them do. I think the budget hurt it a lot. Yeah. I mean, once you get to the effects toward the end, they're not great. I think the movie does a, a really good job with atmosphere and with characters doing and saying things that make more sense than they usually do in these movies. John Carpenter said this was a movie that influenced him when he was making The Fog. And there are scenes where you can really see it. The climbing scenes are really funny because a lot of the time it's just a painting behind them and they're just walking in front of it. There's even one point where Brooks looks at one of the other guys and he makes this motion of, whew, this mountain's sure a doozy, isn't it? <laughs> like it's such a struggle to get up the flight of stairs in front of a wooden painting. I like how goofy the opening credits are with just arrows pointing to people's names coming in from off screen. They're trying to go for a Saul Bass Alfred Hitchcock type opening. They remind me of the credits to Psycho in particular, but in the case of Psycho, they relate to the movie. These arrows don't have anything to do with what happens in the movie. At least they're interesting. At least they're trying to do something there. Sarah and Anne Pilgrim are sisters traveling on a train to Geneva. Anne has a weird psychic flash as they're passing Trollenberg Mountain. Alan Brooks is another guy on the train who works for the United Nations, and he takes an interest in Anne's weird psychic abilities, as well as being in the location to investigate the radioactive cloud at the top of this mountain. Over the course of the movie, the bodies of climbers on the mountain keep being discovered, missing their heads. And frozen all the way through. Even though the mountain shouldn't be that cold. So they meet the locals at a lodge, and Alan Brooks goes up to the observatory to meet Professor Krevit, played by Groucho Marx. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out that Brooks and Krevit have experienced basically what's happening on the mountain before in the Andes. Krevit is showing off all the taxpayer money he's wasting on needless things for his observatory, and he's very happy about it. Well, luckily, all those things become important to the plot later and end up saving lives. Yeah, he's even got cameras that can get right up in people's faces on any side of the mountain. It almost looks like he's watching the movie with us. And since it's the 50s, his purpose for being up there is to research cosmic rays and radiation. Because in the 1950s, the word radiation held a lot more weight of danger than it does today. Yeah, now we know there's absolutely no danger from radiation whatsoever. So Anne and Sarah have a mind reader act and they're demonstrating it for the other people in the lodge but it turns out that Anne actually is psychic and she starts picking up psychic signals from people up on the mountain there's two people one's a professional climber one's just some fat guy she keeps referring to him as the fat one <laughs> and <laughs> yeah I, I like that yeah the professional guide is compelled to leave in the middle of the night he's almost possessed and the fat one finds out that he's missing, and then over the phone, they hear him getting attacked. And Anne sees it all happening through her mind's eye, because Stephen King apparently wrote this movie. And later when they find him, his head is missing. <laughs> his head's been torn off. The guide, Brett, returns later, seemingly okay, although he's acting a little bit weird and doesn't seem to have complete control over his extremities. And eventually we find out that he's under the control of some kind of foreign entity up on the mountain. He comes in complaining about how hot it is inside, and I thought it was very entertaining how he had been missing for over 24 hours. He stumbles in, they don't know how he survived or where he's been, 
and nobody offers to really help him. They kind of let him stumble around on his own. They watch him while he's trying to light a cigarette and pour a drink. They let him fail with that cigarette for a really long time, and Brooks is right up next to him. It's really weird. Yeah, that felt like a British thing to me. For some reason, it seems like British movies have characters stand by and not do anything when they should do something. And then Brooks says to Krevit later, everything is happening exactly the way it happened before. And he lists out that in the Andes, there was a clairvoyant woman. There were people that came back with poor coordination and complaining about how hot it was. He lists everything out that's happening in the movie, but it already happened before. And it bothers me that all the boxes are being checked, but they don't do anything about it. There's that. And then there's also the fact that they never explain what ended up happening the previous time. Where in this case, the threat keeps looming larger and larger. And they say, if we don't do something now, we're all screwed. But what happened last time? And the fact that they have experienced some of this before doesn't end up impacting things at all this time around. I feel like all it does is confirm things for them a little sooner that something is going on. So then while Brett is down at the bar, Anne comes down and he spots her and immediately goes after her with a giant knife. You know, I'll say that at least Brooks is ready to attack him at this point. Maybe he felt like he couldn't do anything until Brett tried something because nobody would believe him. Yeah, maybe. But you would think he would say, let's quarantine you, you know, let something's wrong with you, let's put you over in this other room or something. Get you away from everybody else if we know you're a potential danger. Right. It seems like too many times he has credit to back him up too. It's not like he's the only person and no one believes him. But every time, even though he knows the sequence of events, he's like, well, let's just wait for the next thing and make sure. But he says that every time when he is positive what's going on almost from the beginning. I do like the use of lighting in this movie. Like when they lock Brett up? Pretty much every individual aspect of this movie is better than typical 50s sci-fi movies because you've got pretty good acting, you've got better dialogue and better writing overall on kind of a larger scale. Just a more interesting story than a simple alien invasion movie or something. Even though that is kind of what it turns out to be, there's a lot more elements to it that keep it more interesting as it goes along. And there aren't any periods in the movie where it feels like it's dragging or like it's getting boring or anything like that. The people that get possessed, it turns out they're already dead, but... Then they kill them to stop them. They kill them again? Yeah, I thought that was kind of weird. But I still think it's interesting. The way when they're then looking at his body and the guy says it seems like it's frozen. And then they put the lamp down next to his arm and his all his flesh basically dissolves away. Yeah, that was cool. So Brooks and Krevit know what's going on and they decide it's time to evacuate the village. So they're all going up to the observatory because all of Krevit's taxpayer dollars paid to make it basically a fort. And the cloud is coming down the mountain toward the lodge at the bottom. The cloud has had to stay really high up on the mountain because it's so cold, but it's slowly acclimating to the warmer temperatures as it goes down. So then we get to see the first monster, which was something. <sighs> yeah, it was disappointing after seeing the poster. The American title for this movie is The Crawling Eye, and the poster just shows an eyeball with tentacles. The creature in the movie does have an eye, but it's more of a bulbous form with kind of a small eye on the front of it and really thin tentacles that are more like they're more like tendrils than tentacles i would say and again the effects in this movie are not the best the creature design is interesting in that i feel like it's not exactly what you would expect but the execution isn't quite all there so that little girl goes to get her ball she left it in the lodge but when that girl gets back and she picks up her ball that gigantic brain eye thing is right in front of her and she doesn't react at all until it wraps a tendril around her and then it's the most ridiculous thing yeah this, this little girl is so stupid but also i like the way her mom is like my kid where's my kid my kid where's my kid Maybe that's not a good example of well-written dialogue there. The sounds the monsters make are interesting. When he chopped off the one tendril, it turned into a Three Stooges episode because the thing sounds like Curly. <laughs> the 
movie does do a good job of building up to the appearance of the creatures, though, with the cloud coming down at them and separating into different portions that are kind of surrounding the area and them having to get out before it gets there. I like how all of the doors in the observatory are supposed to be these big, metal, heavy, solid doors, but they're just wooden doors painted to look like that. So when Krevit lets Brooks in the first time, it's this 12-foot-tall, massive metal door, supposedly, but he opens it with one hand really easily. It's like, oh, hey, what's up? No, they've got really high-tech auto-smoothing hinges. Taxpayer money. <laughs> so they're all up in the observatory, and they figure out heat's going to kill them. And Brooks calls in a firebombing jet, and all they have to do is wait. The call goes through. They say, read you loud and clear. Good to go. But then they make a bunch of Molotovs and try and go out there to throw them at the creatures anyway. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, when the monster got Philip, my heart was pounding. It was so real. <laughs> Uh, well that was definitely the low point of the entire movie or high point depending on your perspective i guess so the reason the monsters are trying to kill Anne is because she presents a threat to their plan because she's psychic for for some reason yeah it was kind of vague i mean we know the monsters control people and it has something to do with that i mean maybe they're getting her out of the way trying to get psychics out of the way just in case because they don't know what they're capable of it wasn't quite explained but i feel like it gives you enough it's enough of a reason for the movie i still enjoyed the movie a lot yeah well i am kind of surprised because I, I the way you started out talking about it sounded like you thought it was a piece of crap or something no it would be asinine for me not to like it because of those little things see there you go again all right, all right. no well, i'm saying that's the impression i got from the way you were talking about it what because i'm because i'm talking about this movie like kevin dunn <laughs> this movie was so good <laughs> I noticed how everybody treats Anne like she can't do anything for herself. They always tell her what she's going to do or what she needs to do or lead her there. Yeah, that bothered me. And then at the end, the newspaper reporter who really hasn't done anything, he kind of puts his arm around her and they walk off together. And everyone says, I guess we don't have to worry about her anymore. <laughs> Yeah, it felt like she was written by Stan Lee, where he's like, I have to have a female character in there somewhere, but I don't know how to do that. They kind of talk around her at each other, as if she's not even in the room sometimes. But how can Anne help? She doesn't know anything. So yeah, that definitely bothered me. She could have been a much stronger character given her abilities. It could have been something where she's able to predict where the creatures are going or something like that. That could have been interesting. Maybe that's how they could have tried to avoid them as they were going up to the observatory or something. Do you think this movie has science fiction, aliens, cosmic rays, and all that because it takes place in the mid to late 50s? Do you think if it had been in a different time period, it would have just been monsters? instead of space monsters? That's a good question. And the answer is yes, at least to some extent, because I wasn't expecting them to be aliens. It would have been more interesting if they didn't ever find out what they were, or the radiation wasn't an aspect of it, if it was just a weird cloud on the mountain. I feel like the movie would have been a little better. But those aspects feel like just generic tropes of the time period and of the type of movie that it is, which is a little bit disappointing. Yeah, it felt a little forced, especially when Krevitz said, yeah, I'm just up here studying cosmic rays, and then that never came up ever again. <laughs> My dad said this was the first movie to ever scare him. Really? Yeah. I mean, that's how I heard of this movie, is my dad used to talk about it all the time and make it sound like it was really scary. And like the creatures were, they sounded, to my imagination, not knowing what they actually were going to look like. I was expecting something a lot cooler than what they turned out to be. But the rest of the movie turned out to be a lot more interesting than I expected. Yeah. The Trollenberg Terror, aka The Crawling Eye. It's a cool movie. It's a mostly forgotten to history movie, unless you read Stephen King's It. It has a lot of those typical 50s sci-fi things, but it's a better made movie than most of them. It's a more intelligent movie than most of them. And it has more interesting aspects to its storyline than you would expect if you just went in knowing it was called The Crawling Eye. It was a lot better than I expected, even for the low budget. Like you said, the writing and the surprising depth for some of it was cool. I enjoyed it. I think if you watch it and take it for what it is, you probably enjoy it. But if you're looking at it through a modern lens, you probably won't.